our first speaker. Our first speaker is Deborah Miranda. She is an enrolled member of the Ohlone, Costanoan, Eslin Nation of the Greater Monterey Bear Area in California and of Chumash lineage. Her mixed um, area genre book, Bad Indians, a tribal memoir, received the 2015 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Literary Award. Deborah is the Thomas H. Broaddus Jr. Professor of English at Washington and Lee University, where she teaches literature of the margins and creative writing. Professor Miranda. Salakiyatsa, Haku. Thank you everyone, especially to our organizers and to um, the participants and our audience. This is a huge occasion and I'm really, really honored to be part of it. I come to you from a place currently called Lexington, Virginia. Um, I also sometimes in my more bitter moments call it Confederate Landia, but we're taking care of that. Um, I wanted to um, give acknowledgement to the land I'm on right now, which is Monacan land here in Virginia. This conference in a lot of ways is about voices that haven't been heard, as the assemblyman was just telling us. In Bad Indians, I tried to create a space for those voices and to pull those voices out of the archives. This is one voice, and I thought it was appropriate for today's topic. It's from a section called my very late fourth grade mission project. Glossary definition, Padre. There's an epigraph here from Zephyrin Engelhart. The neophyte community was like one great family and the head of which stood the Padre. To him, the Indians looked for everything concerning their bodies as well as their souls. He was their guide and their protector. The Padre baptized us, gave us names and godparents. He taught us our catechism, officiated at our first communion, posted our marriage bands. He performed our weddings, baptized our babies, administered last rites, listened to our confessions. He punished us when we prayed to the wrong God or tired of our wives or husbands. He taught us to sing. Our own songs were ugly. He taught us to speak. Our own languages were nonsensical. He made us wear clothes. Our bodies were shameful. He gave us wheat, the plow, our seeds and acorns fit only for animals. Yes, that padre, he was everything to us Indians. At the giving end of a whip, he taught us to care for and kill cattle, work fields of wheat and corn and barley, make adobe walls for our own prisons, build the church, the monjerillo, storerooms, promised it all to us if we would just grow up, pray hard enough, forget enough. But it all went to Spain, to Rome, to Mexico, into the pockets of merchants, smugglers, priests, dishonest administrators, and finally the cruel Americans. Nothing left for the children the Padre had worked so hard to civilize, poor savages pulled from the fires of certain hell. He was our shepherd, we were his beloved and abused flock. Now the fields are eaten down to the earth. We claw the earth, yet even the roots are withered and the shepherd has gone away. But we are pagans no more. Now we are Christian vaqueros, Christian housekeepers, Christian blacksmiths and shoemakers and laundry women and wet nurses and handymen. None of us paid with more than a meal or a shirt or a pair of discarded boots, but Christians, poor Christians, drunken Christians, meek targets for 49ers crazed by gold lust or ranchers hungry for land. We are homeless Christians, starving Christians, diseased and landless Christians. We are Christian slaves bought and sold in newspapers on the auction blocks in San Francisco and Los Angeles. $100 for a likely girl, $50 for an able-bodied boy free to whoever bails the old man out of jail. Every one of us baptized by the Padre, our primitive souls snatched from this hell our bodies cannot escape. We are Christian, we are Catholic, we are saved by the Padres and for that 
Jesus Christ, we must be thankful. I chose that piece to read because we are told that Hunipra Sarah brought Christianity to California Indian peoples with the implication being we Indians lived in a deficit of spirituality, of self-governance, and of an understanding of relationship of higher powers. If Sarah had brought us the choice of Christianity with no punishments for choosing to remain faithful to our own religions and ways of knowing the world, perhaps that would have been different. But Sarah did not just bring us Christianity, he imposed it, he forced it, he violated us with it, giving us no choice in this. Sarah famously wrote that he was doing no more than a father would do with his children. Paternalism, as he used it, is a term that comes with overtones of wise fatherly responsibility and guidance. But the paternalism that Sarah claimed as his right to impose was much more sinister. Under any label, the paternalism practiced during the missionization of California was a form of violence, particularly when those being subsumed by it already lived in a culture rich with religion, languages, literatures, governance, family structures, and social traditions that had served them well for thousands of years. We were living in a wealth of spirituality, not a deficit. Missionization for California Indians was more like in of cult than spiritual grace. Natives who resisted or refused conversion were beaten, imprisoned, starved, exiled from their homelands, usually by soldiers at the behest of the priests. Religion was the stealth weapon of Spanish colonization, a moral reason for conquest, to protect lands that Spain wanted for itself. In addition to Catholicism, the Spaniards brought disease, including their own special brand of syphilis that not only sterilized native women, but caused birth defects, blindness, and death. We lost 90% of our population in the missionized territories in 70 years. In other historical contexts, this is called genocide, a crime against humanity. Violently enforced religion is not missionization, it is terrorism. The missionaries' efforts directly caused generations of trauma to California Indians from which we are still recovering, but we are recovering. As Athabaskan scholar Diane Millian writes, we are not our trauma. We can work at healing without being victims. We can be damaged and still be sovereign. Why then should indigenous peoples and anyone aware of or interested in actual history welcome the monuments to Sarah that are everywhere in California? Sarah, many argue, was simply a man of his times. In other words, colonization happens and we should not blame those caught up in it. But that has the flip side. If Sarah was in fact a man of his times, in 1769, when he founded the first California mission in San Diego, he should have known better. Bartolome de las Casas knew better in 1552 when he published A Brief History of the Destruction of the Indies and spent his entire life working for the freedom of Indians and return of their lands. This was a document Sarah and all priests in training would have read and debated. Padre Antonio Jora knew better in 1799 when he protested soldiers' rapes and beatings of Indian converts at his California mission. The church officials in California and Mexico sent poor Padre Jora home, saying he had gone insane from the stress of missionization and his inability to deal with the hardships of the new world. Jora, however, had a different story. He wrote, the treatment shown to the Indians is most cruel. For the slightest things, they receive heavy floggings, are shackled and put in the stocks and treated with so much cruelty that they are kept whole days without a drink of water. Hoda added that charges of insanity were false and brought against him because of his serious charges of cruelty by priests and soldiers and the mismanagement of church resources. In closing, Hoda asked to be sent back to Spain because he feared for his life, not savage Indians, but from his own Franciscan brethren. Many, many other letters, diaries, and records of others traveling in California during Sarah's tenure and afterwards 
left behind testimonies of the brutality brought on by the missions. In 1786, French explorer Jean-Francois Le Perouse observed that during his visit to Mission Carmel, a mere three years after Sarah's death, quote, everything reminded us of a habitation in San Domingo or any other West Indian slave colony. The men and women are assembled at the sound of the bell. One of the religious conducts them to their work, then to church and to all other exercises. We mention it with pain. The resemblance to a slave colony is so perfect that we saw men and women loaded with irons, others in stocks, and at length the noise of a whip stroke struck our ears. Other visitors in the same era noted that Indians were even beaten with a whipper cane because they were not attending during a worship ceremony. These people saw through the eyes of their time and what they saw disturbed them deeply. I feel strongly that as one of the descendants of the Indians who survived the California missions, I have a responsibility to my ancestors and descendants to speak up and to try to, clear, to create a clearer understanding about why Sarah's statues and monuments are another historical flogging of California Indians. These honorings of Sarah work to erase, silence, and discredit California Indian lives and histories just as much as the original missions. No, Sarah was not the only one involved. Yes, he was part of an intricate machine run by the Spanish crown's political desires, the Spanish military's might, and the Vatican's multiple ambitions to convert and acquire both souls' wealth. But Sarah was also a man who, like many before him, was faced with a choice. Go along with the program, achieve his own personal goals, and ignore the larger crimes, or take a stand against inherently inhumane and unchristian acts against a people who were obviously vulnerable to diseases and technologies far different from his own. Sarah made his choice. It was a choice that we, California Indian peoples, have suffered for. Economic, psychological, and intergenerational trauma continue. But that choice does not make him a saint or worthy of a statue, statue valorizing him as a leader of any kind. Those of us alive now have a choice as well. In fact, we have the same choice. Do we remain silent, frozen with old fears and mythologies? Or do we speak out, take action, finally assert the other more complete histories that we know? Histories that reveal the indigenous figure in those statues is not kneeling, and the missionary has no halo. I'd like to finish up with a very short poem. Giving honor from my sister Louise. Eni micham elpa mikhamanano. I feel you in my blood. Nishiyano nishiti anakano nishachurno in my bones, my gut, my teeth. Name si kosura niche ake. You rise all around. Kolopisi kulin opa. Return like a lover. Nishko u niche lahake. My basket carry me. Nisha milia nisha lesapke. My ocean bathe me. Eni name uhum nipsha. I am your hummingbird. Name he iata nechu masianek. You are a flower of the heart. Name cha a nishka sakano. I feel you in my head. Nishku shuno nishkaleno. My hands, my feet. Ukarat kai pire. We dance on the cliff of the world. Name cha a nish cha wa sekano. I feel you in my spine. Nish wopsno, nish dehikano, my throat, my womb. Name sanakak opa, eni inamkak opa. You are a river, I am the rain. Mantuhite, mantuhite. It is true, it is true. Mantuhite, mantuhite. It is true, it is true. Nishwelel, lechwelel. My language our language, Maxiri Maknoko, Breath of Life.
Namaste, Anahel Pasaleki. Thank you.